right, the Intrepid has a Star Trek uh, experience. This is Tom Barry. What, what is your relationship with the project? Well, I'm a museum educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum, and I'm also one of the uh, the uh, designated Trek experts. Oh, okay, cool. For the uh, Starfleet Academy experience on Pier 86. All right, so you know all about warp drive and <laughs> dilithium crystals, where to get them. <laughs> it's, it's my life, and... and, and uh, and just to have the Starfleet Academy experience there where you're immersed in the Star Trek world, which is just really, you know, the world, uh, it's, really, it's really a nifty thing to do. To tell, have. Tell, give us a, a visual, this is radio, give us a visual of what the experience is like on the tra- in the Intrepid. Sure. Uh, so you go to Pier 86 and, and you see... West the, Side Manhattan. Yep, okay. Pier 86, uh, 46th Street, and you see this enormous tent, 12,000 square foot tent, I counted. And you you enter and you you just you hear the music, you hear the theme song from Star Trek, you get a bracelet, you you register it so that everything you do gets recorded and sent to your email. And as soon as you go in, there's this there's this uh, model of uh, the original Enterprise uh, that that greets you. And once you go inside, you're in the Star Trek timeline, meaning that Star Trek is never really mentioned after you enter. Uh, Star Trek history is just history. <laughs> Captain Kirk is as real a person as George Washington. So in, you see all the, the costumes from the shows, but they're not costumes. They're uniforms that were worn by these historical figures from this year to this year. And then you go through a career day at Starfleet Academy, and your aptitude and your enthusiasm is tested in all different areas, communication, science, tactical, command, and you actually get a certificate at the end that says what career you should take in Starfleet. I wonder if Starfleet Fleet Command would approve me for public relations. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I think It would be sad it. if I got turned down. <laughs> now, you must have an incredibly cool job. So... So what is it like? What is it like day to day for you? Uh, well, in the mornings I go in, and we have school groups that come in, and we work with the students. Uh, we do demonstrations. Uh, we do talks about uh, about the vacuum of space and and what it takes to travel to space. Uh, we also have talks about uh, uh, Star Trek tech. So and and I have I don't get to do those ones, but I wish I could. <laughs> Someone else came up with that idea, so they do those talks. Um, and but. Part of the day is also, and it's my favorite part of the day, you have to make sure everything works. Right, so right. <laughs> it's, it's required of you to go in and go through and just make sure that the, the phaser game is working properly or the Kobayashi Maru test is working <laughs> properly. So I, I have to go inside and I have to do all this work, 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 playing with the, playing with the different games uh, throughout the day as well. So it's, it's really nifty. What, what do the visitors say to you in terms of feedback? children versus adults because i'm sure they're all in awe oh yeah absolutely uh i think probably the best feedback we get uh with the star treat star trek uh, academy experience um is that when you walk into the bridge you you get this this kind of <gasps> moment <laughs> you know where, you, where your breath kind of stops in your throat because you can sit in the captain's chair you know and and you do the kobayashi maru the no one situation um, except for Kirk. Except for Kirk, yeah, yeah. And uh, if anybody does reprogram it, I won't say a word. You, secret safe with me. Uh, but it's and and seeing the the uniforms that were worn, it's just it's really, I, I don't want to say a, a, a solemn experience. That might I don't want to like hyperbolize anything. It's a humbling experience. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's really it's really just so cool to see. Uh, the original outfits from the movies from the series and you can see an original Klingon uh, outfit from the original series and you see how, how slight the Klingons were originally and, and they, they progressed as time went on steroids <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna that's get... why they're not allowed to compete in the, uh, into the intergalactic Olympics anymore it's terrible where can I, where can I get myself a uh, disruptor beam <laughs> <laughs> that's in the gift shop right, or, or, or the, what is it the, the, what is the one that the Romulan device that causes all kinds of pain <laughs> oh jeez you know I, it's a bit right yes, I, yes. I need some of those <laughs> <laughs> so, so 
Um, when, when, when could you go? Where is it? How long does it run? All the basics. All right. We're at the Intrepid Sierra and Space Museum, Pier 86, on the west side of Manhattan, 46th Street and 12th Avenue. Uh, the exhibit is running through October 31st. 2016. Okay. 2016, yep. Uh, from Sunday through Thursday, it's 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, on uh, Friday and Saturday, it is 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. There you go. So is there a website for this? Yes, uh, intrepidmuseum.org. All right. All right, last question. When I, when, many, many years ago, I was in Vegas, and I went to like some kind of Star Trek museum that was in the same hotel that Elvis Presley played in. I forgot which one that was. Um, and they had a lot of the same stuff. Is any of this from that, that exhibit? Oh, actually, I don't know. Uh, a good number of the uh, things that we have in our exhibit, uh, they come from a collector uh, and... I mean, there are props from the original series. Uh, there are there are uniforms from. Uh, it, it focuses mainly on the different series, so right, the right, uniforms yeah. are mainly from there. But I'm not sure if they're from that same exhibit or I'll not. I'll have to find out. I'll yeah. have to ask. There them. you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. A pleasure. My pleasure. All thank right. you. Take Live care. long and prosper. As, thank you. <laughs> Right. I'm one of the coolest people in the universe, and I mean the universe. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm James Colley. All right. Now, you have a an, an very interesting job. I, I do. <laughs> I, I tour as Elvis, and then I play Star Trek in my free time. How cool is that? It's like the best. It's the best of both worlds. Pardon the pun. All right, so I have, a, I have a question. Sure. You're sitting around one day watching TV or drinking coffee, and all of a sudden a lightning bolt strikes, and you're like, hey, I'm going to make a museum. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't, really, it didn't really happen that way. It was like m- me and my buddies wanted to play Star Trek, you know, like we did as kids. So we said, let's start making our own little Star Trek fan film. So we built all this set, all these sets, you know. It just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we went on. And then uh, about six months ago, I reached out to CBS and I said, guys, we've got the whole soundstage that they filmed the television show on in the 60s. Can we... You know, maybe work together and open this up so everybody can enjoy it. So it's not like this exclusive boys club. And they were like, yeah, that'd be pretty cool, James. We think you're right. We think the fans would like it. So that's how this happened. <laughs> so so if you get in the car and go to the museum up in Ticonderoga, yep. what, what would I see? By the way, I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> you would see everything that William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy saw 50 years ago when they went to work. Unbelievable. Every set that you see in the original series has been rebuilt one-to-one in the exact footprint that they were in. One of the cameras that shot the original series is up there. There's vintage Desilu lights up there. Uh, the three-camera system, yeah. Everything is there. It's it's like stepping back. When you walk through the door, it's 1966, and that shows in production. Wow. Now, where did you find the raw data to engineer all this stuff. Well, I was friends with Bill Tice, who was the costumer on the original show. And before he passed away, he gave me blueprints and and renderings that literally had the scale printed on them. The Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone. <laughs> it, was, it was giving a 16-year-old kid a new Corvette, is what it was. Wow, it's like Marty McFly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Back to the future in a big way. So... What is the future that you have planned for the museum? Because I can't imagine this is just going to be a stagnant entity. No, it's not. You know, we're doing, like, themed weekends next year. Like, you know, you'll, they'll recreate filming of the episodes and in, and, and like, a murder mystery fashion where you can come and be part of the whole thing. We're going to bring in some of the actors and the celebrities that worked on the show for autograph sessions, private tours. You can, you can get married in there. All kinds of things are going to happen <laughs> up there. Now, that... I, I would actually love to see a Starfleet wedding. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I've seen all kinds of weddings, but... Well, listen, I've already had fans say, look, we're, we want to get married up there, but only if you do it as Elvis. So, <laughs> so that's, again, it's, it's both so, worlds. So you, over. so you need to get, like, a license. <laughs> I, I've got, yeah, I've got to become a minister. <laughs> right, right, or, or a justice of the peace <laughs> or something like that. Next, next thing on my list. So how did you get involved with this particular show? Uh, well, we, we got licensed by CBS for the tours. And then um, this is an official function, so the Reed uh, Pop Company called me and said, um, would you like to bring something down? We'd love to have you come. So we put together this display for them and, and you know, just to try to help out and come down as Trekkies and have a good time. So where did you get Scotty from? <laughs> Actually, his name is Carl Sheldon, and he's a professional impersonator. He, he doesn't you swear that was James doing, wouldn't Oh, yeah, he? absolutely. I, yeah, I, he, he stops people dead in their tracks. He's been a friend of mine for years. He, he does a great, authentic look. I have he to, does. does. Does he sip the Martian whiskey? <laughs> uh, nobody likes Scotch whiskey. <laughs> what, what was your favorite moment as a museum curator? Uh, you know, when I have a fan come in 
and they get into the corridor of the Enterprise where they can just look and they can't see the other end of the corridor, and I see tears. And it's happened a hundred times. Oh, sure, because it brings back your childhood. They, they literally start crying. For me, that's I've done my job. Wow. Now, when, when were you hooked on Star Trek? And then how did you get hooked on Elvis? I, I, found, I found Star Trek when I was about six years old on WPIX. That Channel 11, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I've loved it ever since. Right. And uh, as far as Elvis goes, um, that music was in my house. My dad was a big Elvis guy. He was in the, the service with Elvis in Germany. Oh, wow. So when I, when I was growing up, I always had that music. And then I got talked into doing a talent show to raise money for a, a music scholarship. And they said, just do Elvis. So I cut my hair and I went out and did it, and it and I got a standing ovation. And somebody in the audience owned a restaurant, and they said, "Would you come do that? I'll pay you." And I've never looked back. Wow! Now I'm sure I've been to. I actually did a radio show from Graceland. Yes. So I'm sure you've been there many, many times. What What is it like for you to to channel Elvis? You know, at the home front. I don't. I actually go as as me and try to put it aside because I have a very deep respect for Elvis as a man Um, and I think it's disrespectful to dress up and do all that on him no but I meant to you know because you're you're there you're you know the jungle room I mean you know I I definitely for me like from a fan because I I I, I feel like I feel like Elvis is there because the house is so much of his personality you know so you can't help but feel feel his presence you know like like he's so over larger than life and so overwhelming you know, I've lived with him now for 30 years, so for me, I, I'm never not with him. I'm kind of in step with Elvis every day. I don't, I can't take my hair off. So, <laughs> do you ever sing "Walking in Memphis"? <laughs> I, I do. I, I yeah. You know, I, I, like I said, I, I have I have a whole different perspective on Elvis than, than most people or even the casual fan. Uh, you know, because he's he's put the clothes on my back. Yeah. You know, and and I I really want him to get the respect that he's due. Uh, you know. So for the people out there, website information for the museum and for anything else. Uh, well, it's, it's it's www.startrektour.com. Okay. And you can find out all about us. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now it's a very distinct honor to introduce our next guest. Actor, author, playwright, director, and humanitarian. Walter Koenig, known for his iconic portrayal of Pavel Chekhov. Walter Koenig first appeared as Mr. Chekhov during Star Trek's second season and, it, and went on to portray him in all of the feature films starring the original cast. Mr. Koenig is a prolific actor with numerous appearances in shows like Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Gidget, Combat, and in Babylon 5 later on. He taught classes in acting and directing at UCLA and has written several plays and books, including his autobiography, Warped Factors, a Neurotic's Guide to the Universe. <laughs> Mr. Koenig also is noted for his humanitarian work on behalf of Burma and the refugee crisis there. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we have a great warm welcome for Walter Koenig. Thank you very much. The problem with going last and following such an extraordinary, articulate group of people is that everything I was going to say, they said. <laughs> Um, I used to, I have on occasion spoken of uh, my age and drew uh, similarities, comparisons, so as to accentuate uh, and to bring home just how old it is turning 80. Uh, but I have written a new one uh, as, of, as of right now, I have a new, new one to add. I'm so old, and I remember you, you had to use your tongue to make a letter. <laughs> when I first saw the word forever on U.S. poster stamps, I, I had a very extraordinary positive reaction, first of all, from the, from the, um, Economic point of view of these stamps you could do, no matter how high price of stamps rose, um, but also forever. It, it, it says that we, you know, we're going to be around. That uh, we, we should anticipate that uh, the, that the world will continue to exist, and all the, all these and all the folks in it will continue to perpetuate and. Uh, 
and the future will hopefully be a, a bright one. We live in a very, we live in a very chaotic time. Uh, again, I'm an old guy. I grew up in the forties. I was there when, during the Second World War, uh, and I thought uh, I found the sixties both devastating and inspiring. I thought people rallying to uh, for a better world, to, to uh, not to, to to withdraw from a, a contentious situation uh, where we didn't belong, where our our, our uniform personnel were being sacrificed it was an awful situation. And, and on the other hand, I was I was inspired by the folks who stood up and made their voices heard. And, and Lord, you, you keep thinking that we're going to learn from all of this and that we're going to uh, uh, move forward at a more accelerated pace towards the future that Star Trek had anticipated. And it seems to me like we take, we take a thousand steps forward and 9,999 backward. And uh, I'm waiting for us to, to go where no one has gone before. A, uh, a future that we can all embrace ourselves and respect the cultures of others and, and know that we are in this together. Forever, to me, implies that. And uh, even though that was not necessarily the meaning when the stamp was first put out, it has that feeling for me. I am, I am a product of another era. And I fully can see that. I confess to it because um, I, I can barely use my cell phone. <laughs> I do a couple of things and then I have to lie down. <laughs> so you gonna always find a supporter in me for the mail. And let these young folks call it snail mail. To me, to me it's, the, it's the way to uh, to contact the rest of the world. And I thank you so much for thinking of me when we had this commemorative uh, situation. So what was this event like for you? That must have been really cool. As I said to the Postmaster General, I get to do a lot of fun things in my job. This is definitely one of the top ten. Uh, and w did you get to meet Walter? At, at uh, I did. Bit? I've met him before. He's a delightful, really nice. smart, yeah. and interesting guy. What did Star Trek mean to you growing up? Oh, I think it mean, meant then what it means now, which is uh, hope and optimism for our future. So in the last couple of minutes before we sign out, and thank you for listening, I just want to kind of give you a little perspective on what we saw and what you didn't get to kind of experience when we were at the show. Uh, one of the very, very cool things that they did is they had the Deep Space Nine reunion. There are clips of some of the Star Trek reunions either at Comic-Con or other Star Trek conventions in other parts of the country. I urge you to go check them out. Uh, you'll see all your favorite people from the different ep series and episodes. I remember checking out, uh, to prepare for this show, uh, some of the reunions that involved uh, Bill Shatner. That was really, really, he, he was great. He was actually at this show. They gave out autographs. They had signs. Uh, they had costumes. There was all kinds of stuff for the Star Trek fan. It was just a quite experience. The media was extensive. All the media outlets were there. And I'm looking right now at how uh, AM New York uh, covered the show. And they talked about the relationship between WPIX Channel 11 television in New York that really kept the show going for many, many years in uh, syndication. Uh, some, of the, in, uh, some of the different uh, highlights of the show was the obviously the Deep Space Nine reunion, Terry Farrell, Michael Dorn, Armin Shimmerman, Nana Visitor, and, and I guess she said her name was Nana, because uh, I, I was there, uh, Rene Abajois and uh, Chirac Lofton. So th that was the Deep Space Nine reunion. But if you go on YouTube, there are other reunions in which other cast members were, were present. Uh, there was a Next Generation uh, panel, including Q. There was a, a, a tribute to Leonard Nimoy, which was really, really nice. And then there was a conversation with William Shatner, and he's always entertaining and, and fascinating to listen to. And it's nice to see that there's still a love and joy of Star Trek and the people out there who are doing um, 
new books and novels and comic books and, and screenplays. And of course, one of the other agenda items was to promote the new Star Trek TV series that's coming out uh, on television. So keep it locked in. We'll keep you updated on this particular radio show and on YouTube. We'll see you soon. Stay safe and have a great week. Thanks for listening.